Hello and welcome to the Lucid Dreaming Podcast. I am Jay, and today on the podcast, I am speaking with Benjamin Baird, a research assistant professor at the University of Texas at Austin, and one of the leading researchers in the field of lucid dreaming science. And we're talking in broad about the cognitive neuroscience of lucid dreaming. We cover a wide range of topics from philosophy and consciousness to some of the reasons to study lucid dreaming the science and neurocorrelates of lucidity, dispelling common myths, and some of the recent uh, studies in their interpretations, and a lot more. So without further ado, I give you Benjamin Bird. All right, I, I guess um, I wanted to start by asking you if... Um, if you set out to study lucid dreaming or did you stumble onto that? Like what was the, the origin story of your, your lucid dreaming research career? Yeah. So I started out really interested in consciousness more broadly and started getting interested in that fairly young, maybe 14 or so. Just starting to, I, it's almost a kind of, something that's akin to lucidity, I think, in an interesting way. Thinking, this is my retrospective, you know, thinking back on it now. I'm just kind of around that age, sort of coming to in my waking life, and for the first time going, huh? Like, <laughs> this is kind of a weird situation we find ourselves in. And consciousness was very much a part of that. Now I can look back on that and realize that no one knows what's going on. So it's not surprising <laughs> to be to found, to found it so mysterious in thinking about it for the first time. But I started getting interested in consciousness um, more broadly than that, even in the nature of reality and so forth. And really wasn't until my first years of university that I started getting interested specifically in lucid dreaming. And I didn't know about lucid dreaming before then. And, you know, so I, I wasn't a natural lucid dreamer growing up. I'd never had them personally. Oh. Somehow I'd never even heard about it really um, until one night, you know, late stormy night uh, in my, uh, I guess, <laughs> late teens or early 20s, just doing, you know, reading on the internet about, uh, about consciousness. And I stumbled across the Lucidity Institute website and started reading about lucid dreaming for the first time and hearing about it for the first time, as far as I can remember. And it just completely blew my mind. I had no idea that something like that was possible. And it was just like, I, yeah, I, I just couldn't, I'd never thought that something that having that kind of awareness during sleep and dreams was possible. And so uh, it was just so salient. So in my mind that that night I had my first one, uh, my first lucid dream. Yeah, that's and, awesome. you know, that's something that we hear um, sometimes that happens to people. It's common just enough. That, become so salient that, you know, you have your first experience that night after hearing about it. I think for me, I was so excited about it and just kind of um, captured by it, by the possibility and amazed that I'd never considered it or thought about it before. And so, uh, you know, nothing spectacular, but the lucid dream was strong enough for me to go, okay, this is a real phenomenon. This is, there's clearly something here. And that kind of sent me off from there. Uh, I found it so exhilarating. This is a discovery of like a new domain for exploration, like a new continent of the mind in a way. And from there, I started reading all about it. I went to Stephen LaBerge's workshop in Hawaii, I think probably within a year or two of that first oh, cool. experience. And um, yeah, that was an amazing experience as well. I don't know if you've had a chance to ever go to that, but I, um, I have not. I've wanted to for a long time, but it just never worked out. Yeah. Um, hopefully they'll they'll be starting up again sometime. You know, it was with the uh, the volcanoes in Hawaii shut down the retreat center for a few years, and then shortly yeah. after that, COVID, COVID came. So, yeah. yeah. Hopefully those will be starting up again. I'm not sure what the plans are, but yeah, that's a fantastic um, chance to dive in, and definitely was for me. Uh, but also just, you know, exploring it through other workshops. I did workshops on dream yoga with Alan Wallace and other teachers. Nice. Yeah. Read almost every book I could get my hands on. Um, 
course, it was many years before I was actually able to do research on it, but I took a personal interest and I was doing all the methods and techniques for training personally to have lucid dreams. That's that's pretty awesome. I I almost can't imagine if I, I'm trying to think if I would have believed that it's a real thing encountering it later in life if I didn't have it as a kid. Like it just does sound kind of like what? How is that even a thing? Um, but I I was I never was a natural one I would say except for as as in early childhood where I've had like a handful, right? Not not. Uh, and and then the next one I had as an adult around the age of 20 something um, was with uh, actually uh, LaBerge's book that was published with Sounds True that had an audio CD that unfortunately is out of print. And I think it's still one of the best introductory books for lucid dreaming. Um, they had like guided audios um, you know, that you sort of fall asleep with that, that LaBerge re recorded. Um, and that was that that really um got me lucid dreaming for the first time as as an adult and it was as uh, exhilarating and, and fantastic like like you said it is uh, some sometimes it's you hear criticism of people who are skeptical of lucid dreaming but i think i agree with you that it's it's easy to sympathize that if you haven't had the experience before and if you never trained to have them um then for most people they don't remember, you know, it's not common to have great dream recall. So it's kind of just dreams are these wispy memories that I have when I wake up. It seems very, you know, non-detailed and hard to remember. And so when you start talking about the things that are possible in lucid dreams, it just, it sounds like, it seems like there's a very big disconnect between that and what people typically experience or remember of their dreams. And so I think it's, it's kind of easy to understand or, or to uh, sympathize in that respect if, if people haven't heard of it or haven't experienced it. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and it, um, I, I, I totally understand that. Um, it's the, I think it's the people who not say like, what, how is that even possible? I can't imagine versus the people who say that is nonsense. You're making it up or, or whatever. Um, although again, lucid dreaming ends up being incorporated in a lot of sort of spiritual, spiritual is okay, but like, sort of paranormal, other kind of, you know, pseudoscientific or non-scientific sort of notions. Um, and while I think there are some ex experience that do happen, it's their interpretation that is problematic, like out-of-body experience and some other stuff. But um, but lucid dreaming often is lumped in there with a lot of these and it's hard to kind of separate for some for some people unless, they, again, unless they experience it. Um, but I, I do want to take uh, a quick a quick detour into... Uh, into philosophy and in consciousness, because it sounds like you were sort of uh, born a, a little bit of a philosopher and your interest in, in consciousness and everything else. And I have I have another podcast called Citizen Philosophy about philosophy. Um, so I'm curious, one, if um, if you if you, you you do have specifically interest in, in philosophy, and if you have a theory of consciousness that you uh, that you happen to like. <laughs> Like you know, panpsychism or 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 anything else, uh, or is it emergent or? Mm. You know. Yeah, that's a that's a <laughs> tough question. So, I mean, the first the first question is easy. I'm very interested in philosophy, but I've I've never professionally trained as a philosopher. So, my interest yeah. is mostly in picking the brains of my philosopher friends and trying to read my my best to read the uh, the source texts and and trying to glean as much as I can of people you know, in helping me interpret those texts yeah. and, and you, uh, you've worked you've worked with with some people who are doing consciousness research like Giulio Tononi and and maybe others as well yeah exactly so um yeah at UW Madison I'm I'm part of the Center for Sleep and Consciousness and the principal investigator is is Dr. Giulio Tononi and we work very closely together but I I actually don't work on the theory side so Right. The lab right. is fairly modular. There, uh, there's a lot of collaboration across the modules, but there are people that are dedicated to working and developing the integrated information theory of consciousness, which um, Dr. Tononi has been um, developing for you know decades. Uh, but I, I don't work on that at all. I, I mostly, I mean, almost exclusively do empirical sleep science work. So it's right. very different. So I don't work on the theory at all. I think that's important to say. Um, I, 
I, um, I don't think we have the answer for consciousness still, although I am, I do think that, uh, the integrated information theory does have a lot to contribute. And I think that, um, it goes much deeper than people realize, um, really into the very philosophical ontological foundations of the nature of reality. And I think a uh, cursory glance at the theory, people take it as just one more kind of cognitive neuroscience view of things, which sometimes it is packaged that way. So that's easy to understand, but it really does go very deep and it brings up and takes on a lot of very difficult foundational issues. Uh, so I really uh, appreciate that. But I think everyone acknowledges there's more work to do in understanding the place of consciousness in the natural world. I certainly don't have the answer. Um, yeah. And I don't think there's an easy answer. I mean, we start talking about these broad philosophical classifications of idealism or panpsychism or materialism. I don't think it's quite so easy. Um, I think one of the really interesting things that lucid dreaming makes very apparent to uh, a, an open-minded questioner is the fact that the world that we encounter in everyday life is the mental world. Yep. It's a dream, so to speak. A virtual construct. Yeah, it's a virtual reality that's constructed, if you like, by your mind slash brain. Um, mind may maybe be a more neutral term in this context. We often say it's a construct of your brain and nervous system to use more cognitive neuroscience type speak. Uh, but um, clearly the world we encounter in everyday life is not the external physical world, not the world of physics, it's the world. It's a mental world that is akin to a dream world in the sense that it's being created by your own mind, quite literally, like a virtual reality. I think that's one of the most interesting things that I've gleaned from my experience in researching and um, experiencing lucid dreams is that fact. I think it's one of the most interesting things I've ever learned from any category of anything. And it really does inform how we think about the nature of the world around us and these different broad types of philosophy. I find it fascinating that some of these philosophers were able to glom onto that without experiences, presumably, of lucid dreaming. For example, I don't know if Descartes had lucid dreams. I assume he didn't. But, you know, thinkers like that uh, were able to, they got it. Locke, Kant, many of the uh, pinnacle philosophers of the Western tradition, they all knew this, at least intellectually speaking. Um, now, from there, they go different ways. But I think that is a pivot point, at least, that we don't encounter the external physical world in our everyday lives. And I think that's a, at least a starting place. So that, that takes me broadly to a, a class of kind of indirect realism. And beyond that, I'm open-minded as, uh, as to what's beyond the indirect representation, um, whether there is some kind of, um, you know, uh, something that, that is akin to what we experience or whether it's quite different. Um, this is one of the big debates is, is this notion of representative realism or um, um, what, what Don Hoffman calls the hypothesis of faithful de depiction. So to what extent is the, is the mental model of the world that we experience in our everyday lives, does it faithfully represent or depict those characteristics of the so-called physical world that are quote unquote behind the appearances. Yeah, I was I was just about to bring him up because he has a, a fascinating theory that, you know, the uh the the world is is a as the desktop metaphor, right? So if you you have icons um like the trash can or a a, a mail, but you know, obviously underneath it, you know, there's there's no trash can, right? It's a representation of bits. There's nothing about the interface in, in a desktop computer that gives you a clue as to how transistors work, right? Or the fact that they even exist underneath the surface. And it's possible to, to in some in some sense it's it's kind of true, but to what degree is the question of, you know, what is the underlying reality even underneath, you know, quantum fields and in in subatomic particles and, and so on. And we might not ever really have true access to it and it could be a 
a type of sort of virtual simulation of sorts that the underlying uh, substrate is is just vastly so different that we can't even quite conceive of it. Um, yeah, and, and and that actually brings me. Uh, it's a good segue into into what I wanted to ask about the reasons for studying uh, and researching lucid dreaming. Um, I, I too was kind of blown away when I realized that both waking reality and dreams are this, again, you know, reality is sort of a, a, a construct of the brain or at the very least mediated by, by the brain. And, and it's worth acknowledging that we do have the problem that everything we know about reality is inescapably through our subjective experience, right? I don't think there is a reason to believe that physical reality doesn't kind of exist independently of mine, but it's, it's a theoretically possible theory. Um, but in, in studying consciousness is one of the, the main reasons for, for studying uh, lucid dreaming. And I think about... Um, one of the things that kind of co corroborated the idea that dreams are um, you, dreams are experienced using essentially the same visual system with which you see the world versus an imagination, for example. Um, and I, I I think there's a bunch of things that indicate this, uh, and I'm curious if you you know about sort of the brain stuff. But one of the interesting ones that I've that I've seen is uh, aphantasia. Right, the phenomena where some people can't have don't have access to a visual imagination, and they can't really create images in their mind using imagination. But it seems like those people, at least some of those people, do do dream and have lucid dreams in some cases, and so they still are able to see visual content while dreaming. Yeah, exactly. So it's plausible that there are different mechanisms for the generation of visual imagery across dreaming and imagination. Yet at the same time, we know from a lot of empirical work that the specific brain areas involved in a specific aspect of perception are engaged across both imagination and dreaming and perception. So I should say both, you know, dreaming and imagination. And also, they're the same regions that are involved when you actually perceive that object normally um, during waking perception. So, um, in a way, both are true. So there, there could be a specific aspect of the circuitry that's disrupted in aphantasia um, that's not disrupted during dreaming. Nevertheless, if it was properly engaged, you would see downstream specific cortical areas with that are involved with specific aspects of perception, for example, seeing a face or perceiving motion, those would still be engaged. So there's a lot of work and our research has also found this, that um, areas like the fusiform face area that are specialized for face perception, you see those areas light up if you actually perceive a, a face during the waking state, if you imagine a face, and also if you dream of a face. Oh. And that's true of also other other regions as well. So uh, that's that's been an interesting finding that's converged across a lot of lines of work is that those areas are in, those specialized areas seem to be engaged um, all the time, no matter which which state you're in. Yeah. So uh, I um, I know that the two most common um, sort of reasons that I've I've encountered where uh, for for researching lucid dreaming are one is is consciousness and that has a lot of sub sort of categories the other one is um sort of psychological dealing with with nightmares and trauma and and other sort of psychological issues is there are any other big ones that that um are not as commonly known or or everything else kind of mostly falls under those um well it depends on how you want to carve it up I mean, I think the, I think the consciousness piece is worth reiterating though, because I'm not sure how well appreciated this is. And I think it's really crucial. So I think broadly we can say that the dreaming state is actually very useful for consciousness science for a variety of reasons. One of them is that 
it's a, first of all, it's a brain state that's just different from the waking state. It has a very different neurophysiological milieu, chemical milieu. And so that's by itself very useful for researchers. Um, it's almost like having a kind of different biological organism to compare against uh, the first one from a different <laughs> planet or something like that. You know, that's like the dream, right? To really understand how biology works, you want a, an organism from Mars or Venus that has a totally different origin story. It's not quite to that level, of course, but here it is very useful that we have a different brain state in which we can test theories of consciousness. If your theory of consciousness is rigorous and robust, it should account for perception, not only in the waking state, but also during dreaming. So that's one reason, just as useful in that, in that respect. Secondly, it's a state where there's very little perceptual input coming in from the external environment. And so one of the problems you have doing consciousness research in waking participants is that there's all the processing associated with processing an external physical stimulus. Right. Uh, all the way from, you know, the optic nerve through the early uh, layers or, or early areas of cortex involved with visual processing or whatever modality you're investigating. A lot of that processing likely has to do with the processing of the external stimulus, the afferent input, but may have little or nothing to do with the actual conscious percept. And so the dream state allows you to zero in um, fine tune a bit on the regions that are specifically involved with the conscious percept itself instead of the external processing. So it's, it's very useful, but one of the problems of course, with the dreaming state was that it was impossible to control experimentally. And so you're just depend on whatever people happen to dream about. There's some ways of getting around this. And in our, in, my, in some of our empirical research, we've um, explored some of those avenues, for example, one of the things we, you can do is just collect huge numbers of recordings from hundreds and hundreds of people. And then if you want to study face perception in dreams, no problem, because you've got so many recordings, it's time consuming and expensive, you can do it. But nevertheless, you're still constrained in the kinds of, ex kinds of experiments and the kinds of questions you can ask. And so lucid dreaming is incredibly useful because what it essentially gives us is experimental control over the dream state. And so people can do specific kinds of tasks they can invoke specific types of perceptual content and so it's really a game changer from the research side we now can take advantage of of those major advantages of studying the dream state and we can actually do it in a way we can experimentally control and also with the ocular codes and so forth we have a way of time stamping when that content occurred so it's really a powerful methodology for doing research on consciousness which i don't think is widely appreciated yet yeah then on the clinical side, I think there's research has really just gotten started. Right now, there's not, not a whole lot. We have some small controlled trials, which do suggest a positive effect of lucid dreaming as an add-on therapy for treatment of chronic idiopathic nightmare disorder. So there's people that have nightmares for reasons that we don't understand clinically. And that seems to be the potentially largest um, clinical application, but I think we've just started to scratch the surface. There are definitely other areas where it's conceivably useful. Um, and so, yeah, those two broad areas of uh, research and specifically research, scientific research into consciousness and the clinical domain are two areas, but just to highlight a third one is fun. Yeah. So uh, this is something I, I bring up in a lot of the talks I give, and I'm not sure how well received it is. It probably depends on the audience, but uh, I like this phrase that was in Michael Pollan's book, The Betterment of Well People. So we think a lot, of, we think a lot about sci scientific applications and clinical applications, but also just what about ordinary people that want to um, further their own personal growth and development? Improve their lives. Yeah, improvement, investigation, uh, people's own personal investigation to, as we were speaking about before, the nature of themselves, the nature of the world around them, I think can be a very powerful and illuminating method among others to engage in that kind of uh, inquiry. Um, but uh, yeah, also just the unique advantages the state allows for, for different kinds of things. I mean, some of the things that have been talked about in, in that space are things, you know, not only personal growth, but just how about just some plain 
virtual reality fun. Yeah. Um, your own holodeck, you know, to use the Star Trek metaphor. I've, I've said many times that waking up from lucid dreams, especially ones where I went flying and, and you know, just had had the VR, crazy VR, high res, you know, full immersion, you know, mind control re- experience. I wake up from those like happy, like energetic even sometimes. And waking up like that from sleep is very rare. That's, you know, and, and I think, People underestimate the fact that your dream experiences are legit experiences. They are. They come with everything that experiences come with, including um, physiological reactions. Um, you know, raise cortisol when you're you're experiencing fear, um, or or you know, probably serotonin release when you go out flying. And if you spend so much of your time sleeping and dreaming, which is a significant amount. Um, having positive experiences is is tremendous. It's a, it's a, it's a huge it makes a huge difference in someone's life or, or or can. I mean, it, it does anyway. I think we're just not really aware of it, and especially people who don't remember the dreams. But even people who do, you know, that it affects you. Period. And and the problem probably is that it's hard to fund a research about improving healthy people <laughs> or optimizing things or you know. Yeah, that does present unique challenges from a you know research funding perspective. But I, I do think it's an important point overall in terms of people thinking about why is this worth doing? And yeah. I, it really does expand the state space of the possibilities for human experience in general. There are certain things that we just can't do in the waking yeah. state that we can yeah. in in the dream state, such as fly, for example, or walk through walls or walk on water or other kinds of things like that. And so yeah, what about having some of these experiences? I mean, that seems like it would be a good, a, you know, tr- not just good, but really incredible thing to offer humanity as a whole to really expand what's possible for us to experience in those ways um, and just maximize all, all different kinds of experiences like that. Yeah. It's, it's really underestimated in, 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 it catches me off guard when I tell people about lucid dreaming, the, the few now that still have not heard of this before, and they go, why would you want to do that? <laughs> and it doesn't immediately occur to them. And even if I explain it, I think most people get it, but some people just don't. Until you have the experience, it's it's hard to really kind of grok. Um, but even even back to the idea of, of consciousness and studying that and, and getting getting insights about it, um, I don't know if this something like this has been studied, but I remember even gaining my own sort of subjective insights about how your sort of conscious experience works. Um, when I when I stumbled upon this idea and I, I wrote about this, I call this uh, experiential metadata, right? It's it's things about our experience that it's one of the things about our experience that is so baked in, especially in waking life, because it doesn't go awry in waking life that you never think about, but is there. So for example, um, the few examples that I give is um, you can have an experience in a lucid dream where you see a person and it looks like your sister, but you know it's your friend, you know, like you just know it. It's just, it's the information, it's the metadata about seeing this person. And so it's correct in waking life, but it is still there as metadata. Like you don't think, oh, sister, right? But it's just sort of baked in. But when it gets into other things, other element about our experience that are not as obvious that you sort of categorize in your head, then it gets really interesting. So one of my favorite examples is, I I call it the realism dial, right? Like you have metadata in your experience, in your mind, um, about how real, real your current experience is. And what happens in a lucid dream is that it goes from a regular dream where you believe it's real into suddenly it's a lucid dream and you're like oh this is not really real it's it's just a dream right it that varies for different people and it's it's felt differently but it's it can be very distinct and i i think that there are experiences like psychedelics where that realism dial actually gets cranked up and people think one that uh um a sort of you know i don't know if to call it a hallucination type experience but some some experiences is definitely real. And sometimes they feel like it's more real than reality. And I believe it's probably just this metadata, that realism metadata. 
Um, and there are many other examples like this, but it's kind of cool to even notice through this unique conscious experience aspects about waking conscious experience that is not immediately obvious. Absolutely. And for me, it's really changed the way that I experience waking reality as a whole. I think waking reality is actually much more dreamlike than people realize. And as we were talking about before, for, for me, now the gig is up. <laughs> I don't see it as external physical reality, I claim. Some philosophers say that I can't have this knowledge, but I claim that I, I see it as a representation now, except actually experientially. I'm not always thinking about that, but it really has fundamentally altered the way that I think about and perceive reality itself. Um, yeah. And yeah, it, it, I agree with you completely that it is interesting. It, it allows us these um, to study consciousness and these, uh, I like the, the analogy with metadata of um, these different kinds of disconnections, many of which are present in neurological syndromes. So um, you may be familiar with uh, Ramachandran's research on, on this, where there can be a, a disconnection between the emotional and perceptual regions in some neurological patients, which causes people to think that they're uh, for example, their parents are imposters or things like that. Yeah. So the dream state is a kind of, um, you know, can be a faithful, faithfully the same kind of experience as, as waking, but it can also present these bizarre things, which are an opportunity for research. If we can actually study what's happening in those instances, that will allow us also to gain insight potentially into some of these kinds of things, which can go awry in different kinds of syndromes. So it's yet another opportunity for research. Do, do we know if most of these do, do carry over to the dream state, like, you know, face blindness and, and, and things like that, you know, where people can't quite recognize a person by their face or. Yeah. So part of it depends on whether the um, disorder is congenital or not. And so um, for, just to take the most simple example, you may be familiar with this, but um, people who are congenitally blind do not have visual dreams. But if you become blind later in life, then your dreams can still be visual, which is remarkable um, and really an opportunity, uh, again, for you know expanding that state space of possible experience. If so, you you can you know. It's a state where the blind can see again, the paralyzed can walk again and fly and everything else. And so uh, I think there are some unique applications here in clinical populations that still haven't really been thought a lot about. Um, but it really depends on the nature of the syndrome. Yeah, yeah, definitely. All right, so let's, I, I want to dive a little into actual uh, lucid dreaming research. Um, I think you've, I think you've mentioned, um, we'll, we'll link to the presentation you gave at the Tech for Dreaming uh, meetup, which is, you know, one of my new favorite things. The the meetup has been really going well. Um, I think you you mentioned that when we become lucid, there's like a bunch of faculties that come back online that are not present in regular dream state. Um, are these like, you know, self self awareness, access to memory, or things like that? Which which ones are those, and are they related in in some way? that causes all of them to sort of come back online? Yeah, that's the million dollar question as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> and we don't have the answer. And I'd like to see a lot more um, research on this from a data-driven perspective. Right now, there's been excellent work in philosophy of mind with thinkers and researchers like uh, Jennifer Vent and Tomas Metzinger, who have long been thinking about this and how these different cognitive features um, might relate to one another, but purely from a theoretical or conceptual perspective, which is great. But I think we can also add something from the data and the quantitative side of things as well. Um, generally speaking, I think it's really interesting, but not understood how these faculties relate to one another. Um, although there are some interesting hypotheses and thoughts around it. In, to, to my mind, the three big ones are First of all, the defining characteristic, which is your metacognitive awareness of the state that you're in, state awareness, different terms we might use, um, but you, the fact that you know that you're dreaming while dreaming, that's obviously different, but there's a kind of awareness of myself in a state. That's one cognitive feature. 
The second one that goes seems to go along with that, although it's not always present, but it it seems to um, come along most of the time, majority of the time, and kind of hand in hand with that knowledge is your sense of being able to control what you do. And so that can come in the in the form of uh, me deciding I want to do this instead of that, one action instead of another, or more subtly deciding I want to attend to this thing and not attend to that thing. So the exercise of what seems like a personal will or even free will, if you like, but what's often referred to as control. Um, so metacognition, control. And the third one, the third big one, I would say, is episodic memory. So it again, not always, but it seems that this constellation does hang together, that you get back your capacity to remember your waking life, including intentions for things that you wanted to do in your dream, even your capacity to remember previous dream experiences explicitly. Um, so there seems to be more of this continuity of uh, an autobiographical self, if you like, a self over time in which, oh yeah, before bed I was here and I wanted to do this and now I'm in the dream. And this is a feature of our ordinary waking state that we often take for granted, but we're doing this all the time in our spontaneous thoughts. And we have some new research on this comparing thoughts during the waking state, spontaneous cognition, spontaneous thoughts while awake to the kinds of thoughts that occur during dreams, non-lucid dreams. And uh, people very often are thinking about oh yeah, later on I need to do this. Or tomorrow I'm gonna to take the kids to the movies. On the way home from work, I need to remember to do X. And what we find is those kinds of thoughts very rarely, almost never occur during ordinary non-lucid dreams. Uh, but that capacity, however we wanna ultimately end up defining it, seems to uh, come back online to a very large extent in the shift to lucidity. So those three faculties, um, we can think about what do they have in common. One of the points that's been made by um, uh, Vint and Metzinger is that they all seem to be related to uh, the self. So what we think of as our, what they call the self model, or sometimes uh, the strong first person perspective, that is a key feature of human consciousness and awareness um, that may be specific to humans, at least in some in some sense that we have the capacity to actively reflect on ourselves and our current state. We have the capacity for explicit, this explicit sense of will and this sense of self over time. Uh, so all of those do seem to be related to um, the self. And so that's an interesting way to go. Uh, and I think they've done really excellent work in thinking about that, but I think there's a lot more work to do in thinking about this state shift, state shift to lucidity um, what are the critical features? Do those three, are? does that summarize it? Probably not. Maybe there's a few more we want to add in there. How precisely do they relate to each other? I think all of this is still really to be worked out carefully. Yeah. Do you, um, do you find it surprising that we have um, control not only of the represented self in the dream, but also about the dream environment? I mean, I know that not all dreams include a a, a, a physical body you're running into. Some of them even have, you're even viewing yourself from a third person perspective. You can consciously even shift between first person and third person. Um, but I, I thought about it once and it, it just, it surprised me that somehow out of the box, we do have control over, to some degree, over most dream elements, even if you can't necessarily define every pixel or, or detail. Yeah, it's interesting to think about the limits of control and what we can and can't control. But I, I agree with you that in some ways it's surprising that we even have any ability to control our, for example, the just the perceptual field, because that's clearly a capacity that we don't have at all during wakefulness. And so, you know, if for right now, as much as I am aware of the fact that the door I'm seeing in my room is a mental representation, there's no way that I can alter the shape or, you know, look of the door, change it to a different color, these kinds of things are all possible in the dream state. And just the fact that we can do that is surprising um, because it's just not something that we do in ordinary perception. Um, and 
yeah, it's it's also true that it's interesting um, that there are these limits to control as well. So um, I can feel like I'm totally lucid, can do anything. I'm going to walk through this wall and nope, <laughs> not happening. So, um, so exploring the limits of control and why that happens and because it's simultaneously maybe somewhat surprising that there are limits too, because yeah, if it's just a dream, if it's just my mental model, why can't I just walk through that wall every single time instead of hitting it? So there is this really interesting dynamic where there's surprises on both sides. <laughs> and I'm, I'm fascinated about the differences between people because one of the most common complaints or, or question, at least in, in, on Reddit and in other places too, is, oh, I've managed to become lucid, but I can't control anything or usually anything except myself and even that to some degree like oh i can walk but i'm slugging through like invisible mud or, or something so i don't know what we make of that but it's <laughs> always tickled me yeah i mean i think i think you're right that there's a spectrum of how much people can control and it's probably a faculty that can be trained and which is also probably shaped by expectation to some extent as yep. well yep. people's individual proclivities and other kinds of things so um, yeah, I, I agree with you. There's a, there's a range. It's plausible. There's a very wide range out there. And there are also people that they just prefer not to control. The yeah. And so, but that actually is a form of control as well. Once you become lucid, yes. you decide, okay, I'm just going to let the dream unfold. But that is, that is a, in a way, a certain uh, ty type of control, although different. Yeah. I, and I do think it's a worthwhile activity. And, and especially, I think people, once they enjoy it, you know, many lucid dreams with a lot of control, they end up going to like, oh, let me try to see just what happens and kind of roll with it. Um, so um, in, in dreaming research, um, what do we, what do we know if, if at all about distinct sort of um, uh, the, the distinct state of the brain or neural correlates, you know, with, you know, some of the EG research that has been done um, about the lucid dreaming state versus a regular dreaming state. I think you've mentioned, I don't know if this is accurate, that we only have one recorded lucid dreams in an fMRI. Is that that's, correct? That's correct. Yep. Oof. Yeah. So from the cognitive neuroscience perspective, we can think about, uh, I think currently with respect to the technologies we have for measuring brain activity, it's useful to categorize them as EEG and fMRI. Of course, there are other modalities as well, but those are the two main types of recordings we currently have available for brain activity. Now there's also um, near infrared spectroscopy and other kinds of techniques, PET imaging, but unfortunately those haven't been applied yet to lucid dreaming. So um, uh, yeah, we can think about EEG and we can think about the fMRI. You're exactly right. With, with the fMRI side of the table, there's only a case report. So one single person who had one, actually, excuse me, the, the person actually had two separate lucid dreams inside the fMRI scanner. So it's two lucid dreams, but it's from one person. Um, and so that's useful. It's a good starting place. Um, but we, what we really need, I think, is a group level fMRI study um, that would really move things forward. And that's, I think, what many researchers would like to see. The problem is it's difficult to do because it's hard for people to sleep inside the fMRI scanner. It's very expensive at running at like $500 an hour. Wow. And so there's constraints all around. Are all of them, are all of them very noisy? They tend to be very noisy. Exactly. That's why one of the reasons it's very difficult to sleep. You're trying to sleep on your back on a, a, a hard table for one. Well, you know, there's some things that can narrow be, one too. Yeah. Inside of a narrow tube, you know, there's different things you can do to try to try to make it more comfortable, but, your head is lodged inside of this cage, essentially. Oh. You're, you're not supposed to move. Uh, you hold, hold totally still. Uh, once you're asleep, that's not a problem. I mean, that, that's actually an advantage of the REM sleep state. Once you get in there, you're paralyzed. It's hard to get into the state in the first place. And as you pointed out, there's lots of noise typically. Now, there are some newer um, sequences for the scanner which try to make the noise as minimal as possible. People have been working on those kinds of things, and it'd be useful to apply those in this context. Um, so 
there are, so it's, it's a technological problem and parts of that problem have been solved and we just need to apply them in the right way and do the study. It is possible, but it's challenging. Yeah. So um, what we've done in some of our, our work is take a slightly different but complementary approach from the fMRI side. We've approached it from what we call an individual differences perspective. And so we know that there are people that have lucid dreams spontaneously almost every single night. And so this is a common approach in cognitive neuroscience to different types of research questions is you can take this individual differences approach and say, okay, these, this group or this spectrum has particular characteristics of brain activity, which may be leading us to learning something about the neural correlates of lucidity, even though it's not a direct method. But interestingly, what we've found is that these very high frequency lucid dreamers tend to have increased connectivity between the same regions that were found to have increased blood flow in that fMRI case study. And so they both point to a broad frontoparietal network, which also incidentally we know from the PET imaging on the REM sleep state in general, those regions tend to be suppressed typically. And so this set of regions, including the anterior prefrontal cortex, the very front tip of the prefrontal cortex, right, be right behind your forehead, um, and the lateral parietal cortex, as well as the medial pr parietal cortex, sometimes re uh, referred to as the percuneus, all of those regions tend to have very low metabolic activity um, during REM sleep. But those are the same regions which were found to increase their activity in the case study, and which we also see increased uh, connectivity in this in the, the high frequency lucid dreamers. But we really need more research here. So we need, as I mentioned, the group level study, we need to replicate the findings. It's just a one off study. So we're just beginning research. But the, there is kind of a preliminary convergence, which I think is interesting on, on this set of regions. And I'm just curious, technical question, like increased connectivity means a steady state, you know, neural connections or like a activity um, you know, you know, during a particular event, uh, increased type of activity between areas. Yeah. Thanks for asking that. Cause yeah, I should clarify. This is, um, what we call resting state connectivity. So it's a way of looking at functional connectivity between regions. So the activity, the ongoing, um, actual activity between the regions is more coupled. Hmm. Um, whereas it's not the case, I mean, at least we, we didn't, research this, uh, it could be, but we don't know that there are actual, uh, you know, stronger anatomical connections between the regions. That's right. another thing. You can look at the strength of the white matter tracks or something along those yeah. lines. And we haven't yet looked at that. Uh, but that's also an interesting area for future research. But I was curious if, if that increased connectivity shows up, you know, in a person who has having an lucid dream for the first time versus people who lucid dream every night or something like that. Yeah, and that's another thing that we don't know, and it's another source of variance. So there are a number of things to consider. I think that, for one, lucid dreams, as we know, themselves can be very different from one another. And then people can come into the lucid state in different ways, and they have different levels of experience once they're there. All of these things can be influencing the neural signatures that we see in our different methods of recording. So it's, it's important to take all these things into account. Nevertheless, I don't think that's going to totally obscure, uh, you know, a, a future understanding of a neural signature or substrate of lucid dreaming. I think that there will be something common that's found despite these different sources of variance that we have to contend with. Yeah. I mean, are things uh, that are distinct, like um, like metacognition and and, ac and ex accessing episodic memory, do, do, are those things that show up uh, in EEG or or not quite? Um, EEG is more difficult to capture those those kinds of um, aspects of cognition, whereas fMRI, there's much more of a literature in terms of understanding these specific brain areas are involved in metacognition. These specific brain areas are involved in episodic memory. Incidentally, some of those regions I noted before are very well established to be involved in those cognitive functions, which is yet another reason that we think that they're strongly implicated in lucid dreaming. For example, 
the anterior prefrontal cortex has a very strong literature suggesting a role in metacognitive right. um, cognition of all of different kinds. So, um, yeah, there's definitely an overlap from what's known in the literature about the function of, of those regions and uh, also what's um, what changes in that state shift to becoming lucid. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I wanted to, I wanted to um, touch on a little bit of some of the research that that has helped to understand and even um, dispel some you know myths about lucid dreaming. Um, the first one I thought to mention, maybe there's other ones. We'll get to the forty hertz thing, but um, I'll mention one and tell me if there's other big ones that I, I, I might not think about. But like. There's a you know just a, a common myth about time dilation, right? To be being able to experience a vastly increased amount of time in the lucid dream or in dreaming in general versus uh, waking life, and I think there's been at least one study that has kind of indicated that that is just not not uh, not quite possible. Yeah. So this um, this was early work by Laberge and colleagues. I think is the the, the best research on this still. And it's pretty solid from that, those simple findings that if you ask people to count to 10, so uh, we didn't discuss here the eye signaling. I assume that most people are familiar with how that works, but just to quickly reiterate, you can ask people to make the uh, a, a specific pre-agreed upon eye movement code uh, at the beginning and end of a, any experimental task that they're doing in a lucid dream. And so you can ask them, make the left, right, left, right eye movement signal then do this task, then make the left, right, left, right. I'm going to signal to say you're finished. So you can ask people just to count to 10 in between those two eye signals. And you can do that in wake and you can do that in a lucid dream and they line up identically. Yeah. And brilliant. so <laughs> right there, you know, just from that, you know, just very simple experiment, we can kind of rule out that inception idea of, uh, <laughs> you know, you can live 50 years in a dream and in one minute of real life. But, uh, Important to note, you know, no one's looked at the dream within a dream yet. So, uh, so that's, so Inception still has a leg to stand on. <laughs> I mean, my, I, you know, that notion, I mean, the time dilation thing is one of the, one of the ones that bug me the most, but the notion of a dream within a dream to me just means you're just switching to a different dream. There's not, I don't know that it's, you're, you can actually nest dreams other than just creating a logical seeming sequence, but, uh, but you know. Yeah, that was a little tongue in cheek there. No, I, 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 I don't I think know. we'll I see just... it, but it would be fun. You know, someone someone should do the study. Why not? Am I misremembering that um, there was one attempt at like show that um, you know uh, motor tasks are like ever so slightly longer or so, or shorter, like squats or something? What would they a ask them to do? You're right. There is one study out there on that, and I think overall, the point I'd like to make is that I think we need more research on that to really uh, definitively know the answer. My um, my suspicion is that there really isn't going to be uh, a difference in terms of, of experience time. Um, yeah. But um, but more work is needed really to, to carefully tease out whether there may be some small differences there. Yeah. Um, so let's let's talk about um, the VAS study. Um, that is like one of the, um, you know, one of the studies that has reached the farthest outside of academia in terms of the uh, understanding on the lucid dreaming state and the implications of it. And, you know, you can, you can summarize uh, what that was and then some of the attempts at replication and what you think the conclusion is. It's worth uh, mentioning. Yeah. And so there are two studies here. I'm not sure if you want to focus on them sequentially or one rather than the other. The first one was a, a paper published in 2009 in Sleep, which claimed that there was increased 40 hertz activity in frontal lateral electrodes in lucid dreaming compared to the baseline REM sleep period. And then there was a follow up in 2014 that was published in Nature Neuroscience, in which they reported being able to actually experimentally induce lucid dreams by injecting um, non-invasive electric current in the 40 hertz range into the frontal cortex. So they're, both studies uh, are on that topic. The latter made the former famous, <laughs> basically. That's true, yeah. right. No one cared at first. And then <laughs> the, uh, the Nature paper really, yeah, that was, that was really what spurred it. I think you're right into the, into the public eye. 
And I think you're right that it really has gained the most media attention. That's for sure. Yeah. And, and so, yeah, I think, I think, um, I think talking about just the, uh, the, the original one, um, really has implication about the second one. We, we can talk about why the second one is, you know, n- not as, as obvious and concrete as, as it should, should be. Um, yeah. So, so starting with the first one, um, it's interesting that it, you know, it's, it's an important point that it, it wasn't really widely appreciated when it first, when that got published in the scientific literature, it was like, okay, you know, um, no one was taking much notice and, uh, it's kind of gained, um, popularity after the fact of this simulation study, but really, um, the study itself was an N of three. So there were three participants that became lucid. Um, and this was in a laboratory being monitored with EEG and other polysomnography. And so they, um, did the standard thing where the, the lucid dreamers made the ocular codes. Then they compared the brain activity after becoming lucid with the baseline REM segment. And as I mentioned, they, they found those differences in uh, the gamma band, specifically in the 40 hertz band um, in uh, lucid dreaming compared to the baseline. But um, one of the big methodological issues with that study was that the corrections they did for eye movement artifacts uh, corrected for the large deflections in the EEG activity due to the corneal retinal dipole offsets when you move your eyes. So every time you move, your, your eyes are actually like a dipole. Every time you move them, it uh, creates this large shift, a large deflection in the ongoing EEG dynamic. And so the authors of the paper took care to remove that aspect of the artifact. Um, but in fact, there are many sources of noise, many sources of what we call artifacts when you process EEG activity. And an important one that's really become apparent is that every time you have an eye movement, you also have a muscular or myogenic component of artifact. And specifically, every time you move your eyes, you have little muscles inside your head, which are moving your eyes. Every time those muscles contract, it calls it, it creates what's called a presychotic spike potential, a little blip, which you can sometimes see in the EEG dynamic, depending on your recording setup, just before that that large coronary retinal dipole offset. And um, whether you can see it or not, those muscle uh, movements create a transient increase in 40 hertz activity. And so, one of the concerns from EEG researchers when looking at that paper, specifically given the location of the activation, which was essentially periorbital, right next to the, the eyes, which is the location of those extraocular muscles, which control the eyes, is uh, namely whether this effect was truly cortical or whether it was actually reflecting myogenic activity. And one of the big reasons for the concern, uh, especially, was prior work, which had found that eye movement density in lucid dreaming was higher. So there are more eye movements per unit time in the lucid dream compared to the baseline REM period. If that's the case, then you would expect this increase in 40 hertz activity at that specific location just as a result of the eye movements. And so this is one of the questions that we've been following up on in our recent research was to say, um, should this finding be taken as, in a way, a, a, an important replication of this increased eye movement density, which points to an overall increased activation of the brain, a nonspecific one? Or does it actually reflect, um, as the original paper claimed, an increase in that particular frequency band in the cortex, in the frontal cortex? And what we found is that we, when we actually um, carefully remove those pre spike potentials, or remove the myogenic component through other artifact processing techniques, such as independent component analysis, that we actually don't see any differences in frontal 40 hertz activity between the lucid rim uh, sleep segment and the baseline rim sleep segment. So there's a lot more to the story, but we think that in general, what was pointed out in that original paper is very likely to be a result of the eye movements as opposed to something happening in frontal cortex. It's important to note that um, 
there could be our, our, our results don't actually rule out any role of frontal cortex in lucid dreaming. And there could even be a gamma component. But what we're pointing out is that the, the specific results from that paper, um, we think our, our new analysis really shows that it's, it's very likely to be um, picking up the myogenic activity of these eye movements as opposed to uh, something cortical. So I'm curious um, if if the difference really is between, um, like, why is that not um, registering the same during regular, you know, dreaming, REM sleep with eye movements, because you have eye movements there, is it just the, the density of it, like the increased, um, and, and, and maybe you should explain density, is that like the the degree to which you're moving your eyes or the frequency? Yeah, exactly. It's the frequency. Thanks for thanks for clarifying that. I, you know, per unit time, I was saying, but that may be kind of murky. So it's eye movement density is just how many eye movements you're making in a given amount of time. And so um, it's the frequency of the eye movements. How many? Um, so you take a count. So you take a five second interval, for example, and you count up the number of eye movements and you divide by five. And that would give you, you know, the uh, number of eye movements per second, for example, that's a that's a measure of eye movement density. And you're right that it's it seems to be just related to that. So if you were to take a segment of the baseline rim period that was matched in terms of the amount of eye uh, the amount of eye movements or matched in the eye movement density, you wouldn't see this difference in frontal lateral forty hertz activity. At least that's what we see in analyzing our data. If we take the control segment from a segment which we match the eye movement density, we also don't see these differences. Ah, okay. So um, a, a period of REM, uh, sorry, a period of, of lucidity with the same eye density as regular REM would not register those 40 hertz? Correct. That's what we see in our in our analyses. Yeah. Okay. Fascinating. All right. That, that makes it more clear. Um, yeah, so it's interesting that the density actually makes a difference in what you're registering. Right. We think that's what the driver of this effect is, which was known before and which is actually a really interesting effect. And if you like, that's the positive aspect of that finding is that, which we've now replicated as well. And so there's at least three different labs have replicated this finding of this increase in eye movement density uh, during lucid dreaming compared to the baseline REM sleep period, which... I think is interesting and important on its own terms. Yeah. And it points to, along with a number of other features that we see, uh, as I mentioned, an increase in activation of the brain, generally speaking. Yeah, that's that's pretty cool. Um, I don't know if we you want to touch on the, the the second study and, you know, why that, you know, I, I, I've actually talked about it before that beyond relying on the findings of the previous study in order to select, you know, that what they did is um, applied alternating current stimulation during REM uh, at different frequencies, including uh, 25 hertz and, and 40 hertz. Um, and um, that it, that the, pro the problem I've always had with the, with this study is how long they did this for and, and specifically how they, uh, measured or how they defined um, lucidity in the context of that that study. Yeah, I agree with you. I, I've also uh, had concerns about that as as well of um, you know a number of my colleagues as well when we looked at this paper. So um, you know, I think in general these methods of non-invasive electric current are really a really interesting approach for stimulating lucid dreams. Um, but there are some real methodological concerns with, with that paper in 2014. And unfortunately, they didn't measure lucid dreaming with the ocular codes in that paper. And so, you know, asking people to make that pre-agreed upon left, right, left, right eye movement, which is really it's an objective marker of someone becoming lucid. If you had someone making those, there's no way to argue with it because you can see that there are these objective signals happening in the polysomnogram uh, during EEG and PSG verified REM sleep, and no one can argue with that. Uh, so that, that would be objective evidence of people becoming lucid. You can then compare the rates of lucidity across different uh, frequencies of stimulation. Um, unfortunately, that wasn't done. Unfortunately, they also didn't um, analyze the dream reports, which would have been the next best thing to do. 
were people actually reporting that they became lucid after certain patterns of stimulation or not? We just don't know. They report that they did collect dream reports during the study, but they don't report any analysis of the dream reports. Yeah. In fact, they ha- they asked them specific questions and they've measured the changes in responses of those questions between, um, I think, regular dreams and, and lucid dreams. Yeah, exactly. And so that's what they actually, that's what they did here. Um, unfortunately, it's um, it sounds good. So you take a validated questionnaire and you give this to people and you can... Um, measure different aspects of the experience. It's called a lucid scale, which measures uh, different uh, factor analytically derived um, aspects of experience, including emotion and control. Inside, of, yeah, control. Inside, yeah. uh, the, the measure itself actually has a lot of problems, uh, which needs to be further refined as well. But um, as an instrument for actually detecting whether someone had a lucid dream or not, uh, it's, it's not quite, yeah. you can't really do it because you can give the instrument to someone and you don't know whether they had a lucid dream or not. Unfortunately, there's not a single question on there, which specifically asks, were you aware that you were dreaming while you were dreaming? There's one or two that are close to that. It's something along the lines of, were you aware of what you're experiencing? Wasn't real, which is, you can kind of say, okay, it's within the ballpark. Um, but what you end up with are these different dimensions. Um, uh, one is insight and one is dissociation, which they claim to be uh, the defining features of lucidity, which sends us off on a whole other discussion about whether those really are. Um, the consensus as I take it is that dissociation is not a defining feature of lucidity. It's something that can happen in lucidity, but it's not never been a defining feature. And unfortunately, what the uh, what the authors did in that paper was they said, if you were, quote unquote, high on either insight or dissociation, we're going to call that a lucid dream. And that's problematic because we don't know whether they were high on insight or whether it was dissociation. If it's dissociation, most people would say that that's something else. Yeah. What we really think of classically as a lucid dream is this insight measure of you know, did you know you were dreaming while you were dreaming? And even though there's no specific question which asks that exactly, the questions are related to that. So um, so you can take broadly take the insight uh, dimension as being the closest thing that we have to a measurement of lucidity. Unfortunately, all of these kinds of debates are somewhat moot because there's a much larger problem hanging over all of this, which is that the increase from uh, the increase in the um, frequency um, components, which were said to promote lucidity, specifically the 40 hertz um, frequency component. Right. Um, the increase on insight, even disregarding all the issues we just discussed, uh, went from zero in the sham condition to 0.6 in the 40 hertz stimulation condition, the average score. But the scale goes from zero to five. And zero means strongly disagree, and five means strongly agree. And so it's actually, despite the fact that it's zero to five, it's actually a divergent scale. So about 2.5 would be considered a neutral, uh, neither agree nor disagree, even though that doesn't actually exist. But everything below 2.5 is essentially I disagree. I don't have insight into my the fact that I'm dreaming. And so the question is, how many of those uh, reports in the 40 hertz condition uh, were over 2.5 in which they actually said they had insight into the dream? And the answer is somewhere around four out of 60. So it's only a couple of times um, that people were saying that they did have insight in their dream. And yet most of those um, most of those 60 reports were classified as lucid based on the scheme the authors came up with because it was two standard errors above the mean score on either insight or dissociation, and they were classified as lucid. Um, and so when you look at it from that perspective, uh, it, it appears that from a, a kind of you know different perspective on the data, looking at the data just freshly, um, It appears that only a couple of times, perhaps, people were lucid, as opposed to the 70% time. So we're talking about 3 to 4% uh, lucidity, as opposed to 70%. 
Yeah, that, that's and and that was what I was going to ask you. If again, even aside from lucidity in particular, if you found any of those changes uh, significant or interesting, right, on any of those scales that they that they measured, or were all of them to some degree kind of mild and and uh, enough to not really tell us anything? Well, it appears it was actually more driven by dissociation as well. Um, and so more of those classifications are made on an increase in dissociation. Now, still many of the dissociation scores that were, that were scored as being lucid were still Below. in the disagree end of the scale, scale spectrum. So you can disagree that you're having dissociation and that would be cl classified as lucid. Um, nevertheless, could there be something there? I haven't analyzed the data in detail to that extent myself to really be able to say. Um, it's possible that there could be something more interesting there with dissociation, actually, as opposed to lucidity or insight per se. Uh, so that's possible. I think we, you know, we need to dig in more to the data to see. Um, but certainly, as it stands, the current evidence that we can induce lucid dreams through frontal 40 hertz stimulation is incredibly weak. And moreover, there was recently an attempt to... Um, I, I hesitate because I don't want to say replicate because it wasn't an exact replication, but it was a conceptual replication from Tori Nielsen's group in which they did virtually the same procedure. There's some methodological differences, but they tried to induce lucid dreams using this frontal 40 hertz um, stimulation method and overall, and they measured lucid dreams in different ways, but also with this, you know, the, the more standard way from the dream reports and so forth. And they didn't see an increase in the number of lucid dreams that people had uh, from the, from the uh, dream reports compared to the sham condition. So, um, so overall it appears it's not effective, but going back to what I said originally, I think this is a really interesting space. And just the fact that, you know, these early studies haven't quite cracked the nut yet. I think it's really worth uh, exploring. Um, it's a very tiny piece of the parameter space that's been touched so far. So there's so much to do. It's exciting. There's a lot to explore there, and I think it's um, an area that's ripe for future exploration. Definitely, and, and it, it's barely scratching the surface because there seems to be a lot of really interesting research uh, in general about um, neurostimulation um, affecting all sorts of systems from memory to, to uh, other elements. Um, and so there's, there's just so much to try in that space that, that could be very interesting for for lucid dreaming and it's worth mentioning that you know um you know attempts to replicate and and fail the quote unquote attempts to replicate are extremely important for science because they can help us aim better the next time around for what else to try or you know where where to put our efforts and our, our precious funding <laughs> uh, absolutely uh, so, yeah i agree yeah, yeah. um i think there's one more study i wanted to touch on before i let you go um, not, it's not one study, but, um, one of the things that people ask, of course, all the time is what's, what's, what are some of the best or easiest ways to, uh, to lucid dream Do you know, these supplements or others work and the work that's been done on galantamine, which I, I think you were involved in, in some of it, um, is really one of the few things that we know relatively reliably, um, uh, can help induce a uh, lucid dream if you want to just kind of talk about that briefly. Absolutely. And I think that overall, the um, the picture with induction or, you know, trying to have increase the frequency of lucid dreams or induce them in some way is that it's important, or I think you'll have the most success if you're building off a strong foundation of doing all the cognitive techniques that we talk about, such as building up your dream recall, getting familiar with what your dreams are like, practicing with some of the mnemonic techniques for having lucid dreams. And then on top of that, you can add uh, devices like the um, Nova Dream or other, other devices, which uh, will provide you consistent cues in, in a dream for recognizing uh, the flashing lights or things like that. Yeah. Um, or supplements like galantamine. And in fact, I, 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 I would ask, is, is, has any of those been tried? Uh, has anything like galantamine been tried on people who not only have never had a lucid dream, but have not been told, you know, 
to, to think about lucidity or try to become lucid or give a signal or anything like that? Like an incomplete naive, you know? Um, not as far as I know, not in terms, not in the experimental context of, you know, waking up in the middle of the night and taking galantamine and going back to sleep, but right. you don't know anything about lucid dreams and we haven't told you anything about the study. I think it's difficult because, because if you want them to signal when they become lucid in order to, to confirm it, r rather than just ask them after the fact, you know, tell me about your dream. Is there anything unique that happened? That's a, that's a harder thing to, to accomplish and clarify. Yeah. And I think that the success of that is just likely to be much lower from everything that we, we know. And so it would be interesting and informative perhaps to include that as a, a, another control condition, say, you know, without any of the cognitive training, just galantamine by itself. Um, how does that compare to cognitive training plus galantamine? I think that would be interesting to look at. Yeah. I mean, because anecdotally, I have people tell me all the time that, oh, I don't need to <laughs> muck around with any of that, you know, cognitive training stuff. I just pop a glant to me and I don't think about it. I never think about lucid dreaming, but I can still have lucid dreams. So, you know, I, there, it, for some people that might work. And, uh, you know, you, you might be have a kind of proclivity for lucidity already. And you just need that little bit to tip you over. Just a push. Um, yeah, I think it really depends on the person. Other people that, you know, still struggle to have lucid dreams. So, um, but the work that's been done that I was involved with was a paper we published in 2018 in PLOS One, which was a large scale, about 120 participants, um, double blind, uh, placebo controlled study, which was um, data collected by LaBerge and uh, Stephen LaBerge and Kristen Lamarca over many years at those Hawaii retreats. Actually. It's amazing, yeah. Um, and, you know, um, as far as I know, LaBerge was the first person to discover this application um, of galantamine, which is a class of, which is, a, you know, one substance, which is an acetylcholinesterase inhibitor, um, which other, there are other supplements and drugs, which are also in that category, such as Aricept, for example. And more generally, you know, it was, it was known that these kinds of drugs can lead to vivid dreams and strange memories of dreams and things like that. Lucidity hadn't been talked about a whole lot, but again, in those other contexts where people are taking the taking Aricept or other drugs, they're typically taking it during the day. They're taking it over a longer period of time. Whereas um, in the application for lucid dreaming, people are waking up in the middle of the night and taking an acute dose right then. And that's what we did in the study. And so we, partly for reasons of methodological design as well, we wanted to see how well can you do if you put all these things together, the cognitive training, which people are getting in the context of this retreat workshop, together with another technique, which is now widely known, the wake back to bed technique, um, which we uh, poetically call sleep interruption in, in the scientific literature sometimes. So uh, with the cognitive training, waking up in the middle of the night, going back to bed, and with galantamine, how well can you do putting all those together? What kind of success rate can you have for people that have some of which have never had a lucid dream ever before. And the answer we got was about 43% with the full dose, which is incredible. It's a huge effect. Yeah. It's a, you know, oh, yeah. monster effect. And uh, so that's what the full dose, the half dose was about 27% of the time people were able to have a lucid dream. Granted, the, we did have a small group of people in the sample that had never had a lucid dream before, but most of the people in, in this sample had had experience prior experience with lucid dreams and so it's important in future work to really see how well this applies to a larger group of people that have never had lucid dreams before uh, but with our small subsample of people that had never had lucid dreams we found similar rates of success among them as well um, so it appears you know from from the little data that we have that it's also this is a very effective technique also for novice lucid dreamers as well yeah that's that's pretty cool i'm really curious um how the idea to try galantamine came about is it because there was already kind of known information about acetylcholinesterase inhibitors uh having some effects on dream or was it something else yeah, so I've asked Steve, I've asked Stephen LaBerge about this because um, ultimately it was, as far as I understand, it was his original idea to try this. And um, 
if I recall correctly, uh, what I was told is that um, his reasoning proceeded from the fact that um, prior research from that he did, uh, you know, in in the beginning days of, of work on lucid dreaming, all seemed to show that lucid dreaming was associated with increases in activation, different measures of activation, as we touched on previously. So mm. these kinds of measures of autonomic activation, for example, eye movement density, heart rate, and heart rate increases. Um, um, respiration rate and these kinds of things, all pointing to increased activation of the of the n- nervous system. And so the main uh, neurotransmitter governing activation during REM sleep is acetylcholine, oh. uh, which is widely known, widely understood. And so the the reasoning went, hmm. Well, if we could ramp activation up further by increasing acetylcholine concentration that that may actually be useful for inducing lucid dreams and um it appears that it is however even though that was the original reasoning i have to say with the caveat that um Laberge himself will will tell you that it's not clear still that this effect we see of galantamine is cholinergically mediated meaning that we know that these acetylcholinesterase inhibitors which, by the way, they they work by getting rid of the enzyme, which gets rid of acetylcholine. So it's a right, double they, negative. They break, break, breaking down the right. acetylcholine, yeah. So the double negative results in a net increase of acetylcholine. Um, but um, uh, what's known about these acetylcholinesterase inhibitors is, in fact, that they can have um, systemic effects on other neurotransmitter systems and so Mm. in fact it's possible that they could be increasing dopamine or serotonin or norepinephrine so it's possible this effect could be actually mediated through a different neurotransmitter system entirely and that hasn't that is not currently clear we think plausibly it's it is due to these increases in acetylcholine but it could um, partly be driven by differences in, in other neurotransmitters as well. I think working all that out is one of the top priorities for understanding the neuroscience of lucid dreaming because this effect of galantamine, you know, uh, neurochemically, I think is one of the most interesting findings and strongest findings that we have. Oh, yeah. And so if we can understand mechanistically better how that's working, it's going to give us a better handle from the science side of exactly, you know, how lucid dreaming comes about. Yeah, it's. I feel like it's a huge lead. And one of the things that I'm curious about is what other compounds have been tried in, in a laboratory settings. And, and I would love to see also studies that actually check the levels of various neurotransmitters, uh, you know, saliva samples or whatever, however else we can, we can measure those uh, at least probably immediately after someone is w- woken up from a lucid dream or by other methods, if, if possible, through blood or, or whatnot. Yeah, as you may know, it's, tr- it's tricky to measure neurotransmitter levels in humans. Uh, there are techniques that can do that, such as simultaneous PET fMRI, but they do involve injection of radioactive tracers and things like that, which is... Right. <laughs> it's possible, but it's difficult research to do and has to be properly vetted and justified. Um, so. Um, one approach is to continue with pharmacology so you can give simultaneously substances which will block or increase dopamine, for example, to see what effect that may have on the frequency of lucid dreaming. And so that would be one complementary approach that you could take to trying to at least start to answer this question, which I think would be really useful. Yeah, that's that's pretty cool. Well, um, before I really let you go, I'm curious, what what um, research would you actually like to, to see or, or to do, um, you know, in the, in the future that has not been done yet? Um, that's a great question. So I would like to see, um, I would like to see galantamine studied um, to see what's happening in the brain when people are giving galantamine acutely in this type of experimental setting, um, both with EEG, but more importantly with neuroimaging. So I think it would be another important lead to look at what brain areas are increasing activation after 
um, people are given a full dose of galantamine going back into REM sleep. During the REM sleep period, do we see changes in the levels of activation in specific regions of the brain? And I think this would be a really interesting study to do um, because it would allow us to continue pivoting off of that galantamine finding to say, what, uh, you know, what are the um, brain areas that are, that are changing? That would help us understand more of the neurobiology of lucidity per se. But also, I think it's the way to do the study which we all want to see, which is the group level fMRI study of lucid dreaming in general. And so if you did the study this way, you would have a really rich data set in which you could compare lucid with galantamine, um, lucid potentially without galantamine, um, non-lucid galantamine, non-lucid, no galantamine. And that would A, allow you to um, understand more what galantamine is doing. And it, B, it would also be a very powerful method for being able to have lucid dreams in a context where you could scan them. Um, just because you can up the percentage so much yeah. that it's a, a powerful method for doing that group level study. And so you get it's two birds, one stone. So I think that would be a really a fantastic study beyond that. Um, I'd like to see more localized studies with EEG and also studies with larger sample sizes. So I'd like to see a very large sample size study with EEG, which ideally would also use high density recording. So with EEG, it spans everything from a few electrodes on the scalp to 16 or 30, all the way up to, you know, hundreds of electrodes. Our high density system is 256. And what that allows for is um, uh, looking at localized differences in neural oscillatory activity. And it's possible that with a low spatial scalp montage, you could be missing more localized changes in neural activity that you could pick up. Um, with a high density system. So I'd like to see that that research as well. Um, those are a couple of things. It seems likely that there there would be there would be a difference. But, yeah, uh, and particularly looking that's just my uneducated. Yeah, advice. and also kind of along with that, looking precisely at the transition into lucidity. And so a lot of the work that's come before has been comparing the entire segment of the lucid dream all of that time after they became lucid to all of the baseline segment. Whereas I think studying that transition when it occurs uh, would also be very interesting in terms of looking at the precise um, changes in neural activity at the moment of lucidity, the initiation of lucidity, if you'd like. Yeah. Um, they're both interesting. I think they're both, they're two, two very interesting experimental questions. One having to do with that overall state shift and the other having to do with that moment of transition. I think both are important and interesting, but I'd definitely like to see more, more work on the, on the initiation of lucidity as well. And, 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 and finding other um, correlates for the, the, the coming up to, and then transition like heart rate uh, um, and uh, respiration and, and so on could be fascinating. Precisely. And it's also, it, it also goes together with, the methods for induction because if we know the optimal moments during a REM sleep period when people are most likely to transition to becoming lucid yep. those may be optimal moments for us to give cues to help people um you know become lucid so yeah. it allows for fine tuning of some of the techniques for uh, cueing with external devices uh, to be able to uh, know when those are based on the science there. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm looking forward to all of this happening, hopefully in a not too far future. Uh, ben, thanks for coming on the podcast. This is always uh, fascinating. Absolutely. Thanks so much for the invitation. Great to talk. So as usual, I hope you've enjoyed this episode. I think it was pretty packed and fascinating. I love the science side of lucid dreaming as much as the actual practice and experience. I find it fascinating. And in the meantime, if you want more of me or are interested in lucid dreaming content in between my long gaps of podcast recordings, I can recommend the Tech for Dreaming meetup that we've mentioned in the episode, which I attend and collaborate with regularly. It's a monthly meetup. You can find the link in the show notes or just go to techfordreaming.com and you can find all the links to previous events there and future events. And 
Until next time, sweet and lucid dreams. <laughs>